Oh, Mr. Dell. If you fly at 1 a.m. Monday night, you get there 6 a.m. Tuesday morning. Yeah, yeah. How I'll keep my eyes open there is a little different story. Okay, so, Baruch Hashem. Michal, who's right now in Los Angeles, <laughs> worked on this all the last hour. So again, the sponsorships for the month of ER are uh, the Sternberg family, the Schaffner and Cram families, and the Feigenbaum families. The weekly sponsorship um, is by Shira and Ari Gantavnik, memory of Shira's grandfather, David Yosef Ben Plonimus. We love that name, Plonimus. The PSS and Rebbe's first name. Uh, by Ivan Moshe Kesselman for the Refua Shlema of uh, Eli Burko, Eliezer Pinchas Ben Dvora Zissel. Um, anonymously, in the merit of a, a Refua Shlema of a very precious baby boy, needs a lot of tefillas, Ben Yamin Yeshua Ben Nechama Gurina. And by Keith and Sandy Cantor, in honor of their children, Josh and Jen Cantor, Adaret, Naam, Talia, and Yakir. Today, uh, daily sponsorship, Sunday, May 8th, is by Saren Rebbe Daniel for Yeshua and Atzlacha. That's pretty amazing, no? It's, it's awesome. Awesome, awesome. I continue to dive in for the first name of Meir of or, Mirabat Orit. Uh, just an announcement. To, uh, I, I, I just, someone asked me the other day, how are you doing? I said, I feel like I'm a kid in a candy store when I tell anyone what, what's going on. Tonight's a big night for us. Mamash, it's a tremendous night for the, not just for the shul, for the kehila, really for Efrat. We have the Gadol Ador coming to our shul. And that's Rav Asher Weiss. Whatever I say doesn't come close to explain the schus that we have. I encourage everyone to come. Mamish everyone. His, his, his Talmud Torah, we're talking about a different mashush. They'll be talking about this in hundreds and hundreds of years from now. What kind of schus our door had to have such a tzad, such a gadol. And you know, I know him a little bit personally, and I was in the phone with him last night for a little bit, discussing tonight, and it's, 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 it's overwhelming, and it's just so beautiful. So I, I want to encourage everyone, men and women, to come. And we'll be starting at 8 o'clock. Uh, huh? Rabbi Usher Weiss. How do you describe who Rabbi Usher Weiss is? I could tell you, just come and see. I think he's originally from England. His English is perfection. <laughs> His delivery is perfection. His breadth of knowledge is me'al, anything I could explain. But I would say even more than that is that is a, a, havas, a havas Am Yisrael is something that you can hear with every word of his Torah. Mamash. Yesterday we did a whole, the Emunah Shir was all about, it was based on his uh, Perek Bet and his Sefer Emunah Bitachon. And uh, whatever, Kolam Mosif Goreh. Anything I add will just, will just take away. So it's a big, big school story. A bunch of Rabbanim called me and was wondering, like, how'd you, how'd you, score, how, how'd you score this? Like, what is this? Like, a lot of the tzaddikim we've had here, like, how'd you score this? How'd you get... It's, uh, it's, I think it's because people are people... It's because the kahal are mevakshin and they're mevakshot. They want more. They cause a kriya and shamayim for these things to happen. And I think that's a, it's like a... Boomerang effect of the Ratzon of the Am, the Ratzon of the people, and I think it's a wonderful thing. So we should just like, you know, more, and, and your children, those of that, that could not grasp everything, because it's not going to be like with Rabbi Ginsburg where you won't understand anything. You'll, you're going to understand. You know, you're going to understand. This is not like uh, everyone's going to feel stupid when they leave, at all, at all. I warned everyone. I warned everyone before Rabbi Ginsburg Shlita came. Oh, what about the recording of, of Ginsburg? What about it? Where is it? It's there, yeah, it's there. It's, but it won't help you. It doesn't matter, like you have the recording, 0 0.5 speed, a translator next to you. I'm talking about it, it's, it's a different, it's the same, it's the same, short, it's all the same shorish. It's all the same you saw, but there's, you know, shivim panim, there's different ways of giving over the, the fire of Dvar Hashem. So that's, that's tonight, and I really, really just encourage everyone, everyone to make it, and it should be a big set of and for all of us to just, keep on jumping into the sea of Torah and realize that when we know what we have, when we know we have Torah to live with, we really know that we have the whole world in our hands. We have everything. He makes that, His presence and His Torah, Mamish, makes that, what I just said, very, very clear. Very simple and very, very clear. Okay, so that's tonight at 8 o'clock. And then tomorrow at 8 p.m., Be'ezrat Hashem, we have the schluss of going into Lagba Omer with someone that looks like he's always like sitting on a bench in Meiron, that's Yosef Karduner, who will be with us tomorrow night for Mamash, Fire, Fire, 8 p.m. 
um, here. So a lot going on, and there's a few more things happening throughout the month, but we'll save that for another day, Bez Hashem. Okay, if you could please open up to page Nun Aleph. I'm going to recap a little bit and try to give over what today's shir is all about. The last thing that we learned in this beautiful Sefer, Kumi Ori, I just got to say, Jenny, your nephew, the one that I was talking about at the, at the, uh, at the Shloshim, the one that spoke at the, so I went up to him afterwards when I was leaving, saying goodbye, and just, you know, telling him again how much chizuk I got from his hesped for your, uh, for your father-in-law, Lava Shalom. So he told me, you know, I learned this, this shir with you online all the time, this Sefer, he told me. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Why social media? <laughs> no, yeah, 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 he said, yeah. So you just never know. You have no idea. We have no idea. We know nothing. There's nothing. We don't know who needs to hear what at what point. And so we just, we just never know. So the last thing we learned was a very, very important so talking about our door, talking about what's going on over here. And the title that we had last time was Hatvia. There's an inner demand that's coming from Shemaim, and it's also coming from Aretz. It's also coming from, from here. That what we're involved with, action and learning-wise, is demanding of us more. That whatever was until now was gewalt, it was great, but since now we're out of Galut and we're moving more into the world of the Geula, the Geula for all of Am Yisrael, there's a Tviya Pnimit, there's an inner request, an inner demand of more. I want more. The, the land and the Shemaim, Shemaim writes is saying, I want more. Remember there's a famous word that says, Hashemai, we say in Halo, Hashemaim, Shemaim, Hashem, Ba'aretz Nasan Livne Adam. So it's in, in, in a few different places it says like this, Hashemaim, Shemaim, Hashem. And the land, right, he gave to human beings. Like, heaven's heaven, and the land is for here. So in, I saw this in Brussels, but it's, I think it's brought down a few other places. God gave us the Aretz to make the Aretz also into Shemaim. You hear? Hashemaim, Shemaim, Hashem, it's true. The Aretz, Nasan, Livne Adam, but Hashem gave us the land, not just to keep it land. He gave us the land to make it Shemaim. In Galut, it's almost impossible to make the land itself into Shemaim because the land itself is not calling anything out to you. This land, this actual Eretz, the dirt that is beneath the surface here, and every pebble and every rock and every stone is saying to us, make me into Shemaim. Make me into Shemaim. This is what, this is what, this was the goal. Now in Galut, again, so why, in, why is there a Tviyap Nimit, this inner... You know, tviya literally means like a lawsuit, right? A tviya. You should never know of such thing. Uh, like a tviya means there's going to be a lawsuit. Like they're saying, yalla, yalla, make me into shamayim. That's what we're here for. You couldn't do this in chutzlaretz. And then heaven and earth kiss. Then there's the nishikim, like the Zohar speaks about. Then there's, when we make shamayim down here, we're meeting with each other. This is the tviya apnimit. This is the inner calling, the inner demand that we're experiencing right now, where this Mechaber of Sasson is saying, I think in other words he's saying, this is why the way we learn Torah for all the years of Galut cannot be the way we learn Torah now that we're back here in Eretz Yisrael. Can't be. Mashu, mashu acher. Sorry, not Mashu acher. that means something else. Od Rovet, yeah, another layer, and he's going to be very clear about that. He's not saying something else. He's not saying, and I have friends that, that they say, listen, we're back in Eretz Yisrael, why would I learn Bavli, Babylonian? Right? Why would I learn the Torah of Galut? Right? Now there's a, I, listen, Kav Schus, there's something, it's, it's, it's coming from a little bit of a confusing place, but there's something to what they're saying. Only Yerushalmi, right? only Talmud Yerushalmi, we learned that the Torah that came out in, in you know, Chachme Yerushalayim, Chachme Eretz Yisrael. But we're going to be seeing here He's been, I think, like, this would be a great share if I ever wanted to explain to anyone, why do you guys learn what you learn in Shirat David, and how come they're not learning this stuff anywhere else in the world, a- anywhere else in Eretz Yisrael, in a Mesudar kind of way like this? This would be a great share to try to explain why. This would be a great share to try to explain why, as well as the question of what are you referring to when you say, 
Pnimiyut HaTorah, learning Pnimius. You've heard this concept before? Pnimius? Now you can learn pnim, you can learn everything in a, in a Pnimi way. I could keep on pushing this shir because I just believe in it so much. Go to one of Eli Mishal's, Rabbi Eli Mishal's classes on Nach, on, on uh, Nevim. He's doing David HaMelech right now. There's a way to learn Nach like you do in Chutzlars, and there's a way to learn Nach where you're learning the Pnimius of Nach because you're living in the, in the, in the area, in the, in the place where these stories took place, and the land is calling you and saying, you think this is just a storybook to tell you what's, what, what happened once upon a time? These are, these, are, these are storybooks that are telling you what happens right now. I'm sure when Yoni gives Torahs, this is exactly his Torah. Yeah. He brings it alive. When Yossi gives Torahs also, when Yossi says, he, it's, not, it's not history. It's not history. It's now. It's, it's both. It's, it's history, present, and future. It's mamash all together. There's a way of learning Torah like that. And that's, that's a very important yisod of what we're going to be seeing right now. And Rev. Cook spoke about the fact that we see people that understood we're back in the land and there was a gap between what their neshamas were saying they needed and what was being presented to them in terms of learning. Look at the bottom paragraph on Nun Aleph. Kach nimtza anashim ha-shoafim lemerchavim ruchanim le-omakim nafshim verigshim We find people that aspire to very deep and wide spiritual aspirations to deep and emotional soul reachings, Shema Asuba Torah Mitzvot. And what happened to them? They said bye bye Yiddishkeit. Now this is why Rav Kook was so ridiculed and so hunted and hunted down. Because he would see people that checked out of Yiddishkeit and be like, you don't understand. They 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 need more. And what you're giving them isn't adding up at all to what their Neshama is saying they need. <laughs> These people felt choking to their spirit. They felt their spirit being choked. They felt that the frame of Torah and mitzvot that they're being giving now is not at all giving a true ma'ane, an answer, a supply to what their spirit is asking. Let me speak about this a lot in the 70s. In the 60s and 70s, where you'd have these hippies that were flying in India or other places, they're so high, they're experiencing such high elated moments, but something in them said, I'm a Yid, I gotta come home to Yerushalayim. They come to Yerushalayim, they find the yeshiva, because that's where you learn the word of God, and the first thing the rabbi says to them, you know you have to cut your hair in order to learn here. Bye-bye. It was cute. I'm back. I'll go back to my swami. I always say that. I always try to like measure, not measure, but like. I always try to, when I look around shul sometimes on Shabbos, I always ask myself, would Yitro choose to continue being part of Am Yisrael if he walked into our shul? Because he tasted every single, you know, avoida in the world, right? Every avoida zar in the world, all these spiritual avoida zars in the world. But would he, would, he, would he say, yeah, I, this is where I'd want to be, right? And I think that's a very good, it's a very hard litmus test, but it's a very important one for us to understand that we're living in a world where we all have access, whether we implemented it or whether we took advantage of it or not, we all have access to a lot of other spiritual high cultures um, that, that have given tremendous spiritual satisfaction to those that are looking for something. Um, all the time I have people ask, Chavra ask me, like one of some of my like real, like the musician Chavra, that aren't into anything, but they get a little bit of a taste of Shabbos and things. Like, where could I go to? What yeshiva could I go to? To go and learn more about this. Lo pashut. Come here. Amen. Amen. Lo pashut. It's not so simple. It's not a simple thing. Rav Kook saw these people were really wanting more. That's where it's coming from. Their rebellion was because they wanted more, and they felt choked, they felt spiritually suffocated. Fourth line, They wouldn't have checked out of Yiddishkeit, if they would have checked out of Yiddishkeit. This thing would not have happened if they were being served the Torah with all of its richness and depth. They would be, if, if the Torah was given to them with the depth, the pnimius of the Torah, 
they would see everything they're looking for is right there. Everything they're searching for is right there. The problem is the server. The server, the one that's serving it, putting it on the table, is basically saying, you know, a person's asking, I want to see the menu. Now you yourself only know of three things that are on the menu, so you show them what you know, thinking it's the whole Torah. But really, there's a much larger and longer menu that serves many more rich delicacies than what you're serving them. I've shared this with you many times, that one of the reasons why I had to stop anytime anyone mentioned the name of Cook to me and my friends, around high school time, we were, it, would, it would turn us off so much because we were in a Bnei Kiva yeshiva, so of course Rav Cook is somehow shows up there in part of the curriculum, but the way it was given over to us made us feel like um, made us feel bored, stiff, completely not interested at all. And it, might, it took like seven or eight years, Mehmet, till I could hear his name again, till I started hearing it from Rev Weinberger, and then I started realizing, oh, Rev Shlomo did teach him a lot. But till Rev Weinberger really started bringing the, the, the nishmas Rev Cook to the table, it was very hard, and it's amazing. I am getting a call, right, I've been getting calls right now on behalf of one of the Rashi Yeshiva of Merkaz Arav, Merkaz Arav is Rav Cook's Kilo, you know. It was his, he founded a yeshiva, right? And it's a Rosh Yeshiva. It's still not public because it would be a big threat to all the other Rosh Yeshivas who said he came across Rav Weinberger's Perush on Oros It's a four, I think it's a four-volume series. It's unbelievable. If you don't have it, it's a Chiv. I think it's four volumes. And he said that basically he finally met someone that he feels got Nishma Sarav and he wants to meet him. So if Weinberg is actually coming here next week, and I'm trying to see if we can make a meeting happen, it's very special. Fourth line from the bottom: Ki azay roim shat Torah bevaday notenet manen achav meod lekol akisvim pnim shel ruham. Bemuvan ze in this manner, hosafat osher veomek ze raki chazek et hakayam. When you show what Pneumius is all about, it doesn't mean that the regular stuff that we learned all the years is not relevant. It just makes, the, it makes all the Torah of Galut that much deeper as well. You understand? It's not saying we need a new Torah. It just takes what we had and realizes that it shows the depth and the Pneumius of it. It only gives strength to that which exists already. It'll deepen its roots. They are chiv et anafav, and it will spread its branches b'tzua eitanavi yitziva in a firm and concrete manner. Bilvavot am Yisrael in the hearts of am Yisrael. And here we are going to learn four, five lines from Rav Kook. From Orot Atchia, v'kach niteach Rav Kook zatzal et sibat akfira b'dor acharon. This is how Rav Kook explained the reason why there's so much heresy in the previous generation. Now let's let's explain this for a second. What type of Jew was Rav, was Rav Kook referring to in these lines? It's a Jew that his father probably had Peus and, 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 and a Strimal. And the son looked like... Huh? A settler without a kippa, A settler without tzitzis. It's, no, that's important. It's a big chiluk. Meaning, a, a, he looked like a settler, but not a settler that's like, you know, singing Yibane uh, Amigdash while he's, you know putting up a caravan in the middle of the night to settle the land. In fact, those, those settlers had wanted nothing to do with Yiddishkeit on the surface. So all of the Rabbanim are looking at these people and saying, this is the Rabbim Mamash, this is Mamish, the evil that's going to come and end Am Yisrael. These kind of chevra are going to end Am Yisrael right now. Rav Kook says, saying to them, don't you see beneath the surface of what these people are doing? You think that's what they're trying to do? If that was really the reason, they would do, use all their kochot and build settlements in New Zealand or wherever, or Wyoming. Why, what's, the, what's the obsession with doing it here? Because they're so connected to the land, but no one gave them the Torah of Shamaim and Aretz. No one gave them the Torah of making, making Shamaim on Aretz. They just know of Aretz. They see people of Shamaim, and they're like, Shamaim has gotten us pogroms, anti-Semitism, Jews being a mockery, and they're saying, enough of, if that's what Yiddishkeit is, I don't want anything to do with that. I'm a Jew. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build the land. The Aretz, the Aretz is not mocked. The Aretz is not belittled. Working in the Aretz is not looked at as something that's nebuch, 
וכולי. So Rav Kook saw this when he looked at the Yid. It's amazing. It's an, how, now, my, my dream is to spend like at least five years trying to understand how he was able to look like this at people. Ech zeacholiyot. What kind of Torah did he learn in Galus? He learned in Velazhim. How in the world did he come to the place where he looked at people the way that he looked at is my dream to start to scratch the surface of it. I think 1904. Could be wrong. And then he was stuck in England for like two years of World War well, One or something. Yeah, but but he was yeah, but most of the time yeah, but most of the time he was here. He was in stuck in he was stuck he was in Basel and in England, but he was here, I think from nineteen oh four and he died in nineteen thirty five. And he was persecuted from the day he stepped foot in the Eretz Israel in Yafo till the day of his petira. We spoke about this in Shul yesterday, how he was still able to love people. I want to know how he got to the love of people. Well, because he was, I, in my opinion, he was a great set, a mystic. So a mystic can see the, the Matsuk and the pain of it. The pain is what's critical. I mean, I'm sure that's, I'm, the question's still there, so how did he become? I, he there were a lot of great mystics back then. Their Indian didn't... Well, that, that, Hashem, no? <laughs> if, oh, that's the, if that's the answer, then I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> If the answer is, oh, it's just a gift from Hashem, then I was like, oh my God, so how do you, uh, there's got to be some kind of Torah behind this, you know? If I just say it's a matana for Hashem, I, then, then my answer is, okay, go and daven. Go and just daven and daven and daven, daven for an, uh, a gift. I think there's something there. There's, there's got to be something there. You're saying that everyone was learning the Torah Shemayim, but not Eretz Shemayim. No, so right. who, like, how did he know what the Torah of the Eretz was? Well, so kind of what, what, what you're saying is that he had some kind of a, a gift from Hashem that enabled him in a mystical manner to connect the two. What I'm saying is I want to know what that... There's, I, I believe there's got to be a Torah of it. I think we're learning it, by the way. I'm just saying. I actually think we're learning what I'm talking about. I just wanted to make it more exciting. But you, know, you understand what I'm saying? That's what we're doing here. Say that? What? 1904, right? You just check. Yeah, yeah, 1904. He was in Yafo for a while in the beginning. Then he moved to Yerushalayim on Chavchet Iyar, Yom Yerushalayim. It wasn't Yom Yerushalayim yet, but it was you know, late in Yerushalayim. And yeah, yeah, one of the highest Yom Yerushalayims we ever had. I don't know any, if any of you were with us. It was, you were there? Uh, you were there. It was doing Halal Yom Yerushalayim in Rav Kook's base Medrash. But we could never go back there because it was an absolute danger hazard. It, the shul is smaller than this room. Um, and there, there was no... I, I'm tempted to do it again this year, but I know it's, it's not... It's like it's Sakanas Nefashas. You can't... Uh, mamash, the shul is smaller than this room. And I don't know how many hundreds of people were in there. Okay. Let's just... Let's go... That, let's, look at Rav Cook's word, the quote over here, Okay. The tziyur, the vision, the, the, the imagination, the illustration of how great the godly light is, it truly is, is so large in the depth of the neshamas of the last generation before Mashiach. In Galut, my godly visualization of godly light, how big was it? It was, it was, if it existed at all, it was minute, very tiny. That's what Galut does to us. He's saying, but the, this, we're dealing with a, a door that's back here in Eretz Yisrael. Their visualization and their expectation and their anticipation for what godly light means is not being met at all with what they're being given taught in the name of God. It's so large that it's caused a problem between, you know, this is literally the word shtimming. To shtim means to, mo- to, to, to come together. When you, in learning, when you say, does this shtim, meaning does this add up, does it feel right, does it come together? Rav Kook is saying the people that have this incredible vision of how large the light of God is have not found a way for that to make sense in their daily life of being, of being a Jew now in, in Eretz Yisrael. Doesn't, it doesn't add up. 
No one's showing them how it, how it comes together. It's the people that are le- holding from Shemaim, so to speak, are still holding from Shemaim. And there's got to be a way to connect the two, because otherwise the whole thing's going to blow up. Mitoch kach, from this place, ba kfira. Kfira, being a heretic, right? being a kofir, where does it come from? It comes from frustration. Nachon, it comes from frustration, Rav Kook says. It's coming from an inability to see how does the, the Jew that's able to visualize light in a much greater way, how is he able to, how is it able to add up to what they have in front of them? Is this making, is this, is this coming across? Not so much? It's almost like Hashem's doing each other small. I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It almost sounds like that they're making each other small. Like who, who's they? Meaning the people who, who the Shemaim. Right, but let, let's just explain that a bit more. What is Shamayim over here in this context? Um, the people that are teaching Torah. Mm, yes. Is that clear? Or, people that are ki'ilu teaching Torah and, and are talking about heavenly matters, yeah? But they can't relate to the students. They can't relate to the students. The students can't relate to the they teachers. So they, find another, another they saying, they if these them. people are representing what we're trying to do over here, this is not, then this ain't for me. This is not for me. This is not adding up. It can't. It doesn't. Doesn't. It doesn't go together. Can you give an example of what they were turned off from? What exactly would be the Torah of Shemayim that didn't speak to them? I could give you so many personal examples from high school. Mm. I'm, I'm serious. I can give you so many <coughs> personal examples from high school, but that's my story. Uh, can I give an example of of the, of then of 1904, 1905? Probably. Let's think about this for a second. What would be a good example? I think it was the feeling of well, we are just letting people walk all over us. We're weak. We're t- saying that Hakol, I, th- I think everything comes from Hashem, but then physically we are actually being killed. And they're just like, we, that's what I understand. And then they come to Eretz Yisrael, let's say. They, they, so we want, they, they want to be soldiers. They and want to protect a, themselves. They want to. They I want to stay alive. Hands. They, they were just like, we're not letting people walk all over us. That's what I understand. And the, others, and the other voice is saying, listen, there's a plan. There's like, a plan. I want to stay alive for a plan. Let's right? stay actually alive. I want to actually be alive, you know? Okay. So it's not like the, like, like all the, the Torah, like, Motase, like the things that you can't do. It, it would, listen, that's an, that was an easy thing for them to, to also say, like, I'm trying to stay alive and stop persecution in 2,000 years what are you talking to me about shatnas right now? Right. You understand? The mind of the pioneer warrior. Don't talk to me right now about tchumim on Shabbos. 2,000 years, where did it get us? Right? right? Now there's, so there's so many thousands of examples like this. But it built up this, and you, then you have people like Jabotinsky. And you have these like great early Zionist leaders that they weren't, listen, they, it's again, like Rev Weinberg once said, you, don't, you wouldn't want to mashadich your child with one of Jabotinsky's children, but you have to look at them and be like, what were they trying to do? They were trying to restore Jabotinsky specifically, and begging was like the biggest Talmud of Jabotinsky. What was the word? Does anyone know the word that Jabotinsky, Zev Jabotinsky, tried to, uh, tried to create a whole movement behind? A beautiful word, a holy, holy concept. He called it Hadar Yehudi. Hadar. What is Hadar? And what, what else? Who looks beautiful? Who has splendor? A, pride, a proud Jew. A proud Jew is beautiful. A shtetl Jew doesn't have Hadar Yehudi. Now, again, maybe yes, maybe no. That's not the point. But if Cook is trying to explain... To other 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 rabbanim that are knocking off that whole door of meazdeya aretz, and he's saying, "Don't you see where they're coming from? You just you yourself don't really have enough shemaim in you to bring it down to aretz. Because if you did, you'd be able to see what I'm seeing. And if you did, you'd be able to give over to them Yiddishkeit and showing them there's no stira between the Torah we learned in Galut and what we're now going to be learning. But what happened was is that the yeshivas the system was just our Indian is Hashem. This, what did you say? Keep on going, like uh, Hashem Yazor, keep on going. Kilu, the, the show must go, we, we keep on going on. Uh, 
this is an interesting. I once saw. I once. This is before, and this is before. But even, but even, but even scarier that it also that lashon was also after the Holocaust. That, that's what's even scarier. What's even scarier is that the the ma'ane, the answer to those that wanted more after the six million were sometimes met with. Our thing is that we keep on going no matter what. That's why, and I know, you see I get very agitated by this, I get so sick to my stomach after Yidin are killed here, and the answer is, we show our strength by life goes on. That hasn't deterred one Yishmaeli from killing a Jew before, just for putting it out there. It's never, ever shown any Yishmaeli, maybe it's not worth trying to kill Yidin. It's our, it's our galut mind. It's our galut obsession with, with survival. It's not all our fault. Hashem put us there for 2,000 years. We're still ridding ourselves from this thing. But Rav Kook is saying to the people that Kiv is supposed to represent Shemaim to the Aretz and saying, they're waiting for Baal Shem Tovs to come and talk to them about God. What are you guys? He's basically saying, get up. Become, re- become real Emes Dika, Primis Dika leaders. They don't need to hear this anymore. In fact, look what, look, what, look what they're hearing is causing them to do. They're eating treif on Yom Kippur. And the Rav is saying, hey, they're eating treif on Yom Kippur. And Rav Kook is saying, no one ever showed them how to mechaber shamayim va'aretz. You know, in the beginning, I wonder, like the beginning when Rav Kook was meeting, like on these trips with, with the, with the Anshe Moshava, you know, all these people that were completely menutak, I wonder if they thought in the beginning that he's just trying to play a fast one on them. And he's just trying to get them to really just put on tefillin and say Shema. It's really just an undercover, a secret Kiruv mission, you know? Was, that, well, was it heard of back then? What we're no. concentrating on now is connecting the depth. If someone had taught me in high school, here, in Israel, right. the Talmud just told a shot, I could have connected a lot of it. Right. I'm wondering, wondering about 100, 100 years because you were a teenager. So Could be. These these weren't necessarily teenagers. They were a little bit older. Could be. We don't know. I, though I, I want to say a kav schut. Things have gotten much better. Do you do you know what's written on like almost every gun that I've walked into the last five years? Kol yelet tzarich ben adam echad sheyamin bo. Right. So if a kid is looking, I don't know if they could read it, but if, you know, I don't know if kids in Gan read. Maybe at Gan, maybe in Mechina they, they read. That. In Mechina hopefully they read. But like that never, ever existed in any school, Gan, high school, college, 50, 70, 80, 100 years ago, that you walk into your education center and there's a line on the wall that says, you know what you really all need? You just need one person that believes in you. There was nothing like that. Nothing. Nothing. I know, I know, I'm giving, I know. (laughs) Of course it is, of course it is. I know, but I just think it's better. So who, so, so. Who who can you put there to teach who knows more? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to toot, I'm going to toot Shira David's horn right now for a second. You all saw, we're starting an institute, this, this, this Elul, that but Ezra Hashem will last forever, where we're taking potential young leaders, men and women, young families. Right now it's going to be six families that are moving in here. And spending two years of them learning this Torah almost every afternoon before they go and set out and try to open up new communities here. Because it has to be, because what, what else is the Avodah, right? What else is the Avodah? I but hope, I hope. It's our achrayut. You're right. You can only teach what you know. So the Rebbe said, if you know Aleph, teach Aleph. That was Babach Rebbe's in you. Mm-hmm. You know Bet, teach Bet. That, that's our shita. You know something, you teach it. Yeah. But what you do know is what Rav Kook did. Is you got to know the people. And that a hundred percent. A hundred percent. That's why in Shul a few weeks ago, I, I tried to, and, and the truth is, I was answered, it was answered positively, where I said about, I spoke about a group of Haridim that Sivan Rav Mir posted about this. I don't know if any of you heard about this. About seven families, which was enough for a minion with their children, that went to a kibbutz up north, or in the Bik'ah, without, a, without this mission of we're going to turn them on to Shabbos. They set up the way they brought, they brought kosher food and pa- uh, you know, paper, pl- whatever, and they just said, we're not coming to try to, we're, ch- we're coming to meet you. And they had an amazing Shabbos. So I said in Shul, I want to start doing that. 
we, I spoke about it with you, and then last week someone came to me and said, I'm putting down thousands of shekels for you to organize the first Shabbos, go and do it. Yeah. It's big things. This is Rav Cook. This is Rav Cook. Mamash. I think it's the most essential thing. It'd be a beautiful thing. I think if I personally went and did this once a month, it'd be bad for the shul, but I think it'd be good. <laughs> I think it'd be good to start 100%. And when I get back next week, there's going to be, I'm meeting with a few chavit to try to focus and make sure that this happens. Nachon, Jenny, you're right. Rav Cook met the people. Without, knowing, without meeting the people, you don't know what they really want. You just assume and you speculate. And Rav Kook met the people, and he's coming back and saying, let me explain to you how kfira takes place. Let me, let me explain to you why kfira happens, how we got to this place. And he's basically, without saying it, he's saying, it's on you. It's not on them. They're, they're doing, they're, they're, not that they're fine, but... They're responding to what they were doing. They're, exactly, they're doing them. There's no, expect, there's no greater expectation from them. So it puts such an expectation on an educator. You know, one of the Lubavitch, one of the books that they put out in Chabad, they, they, what they do is they would take ma'amarim of the Rebbe, and they would mamish bring it down into such a concise, beautiful, clear manner, and there's a whole series of them. It's short, thin books in English. And one of them is called The Educator's Privilege. It's such a great title, The Educator's Privilege, where the Rebbe is enforcing that the mechanech is privileged as opposed to obligation. Obligation stresses more pressure. Pr- excuse me. Privilege, bring, it has more light to the word. No? When you say the word privilege, it's more light. Obligation is like, there could be light there, but it's stress, it's shpilkas, you know? It's, 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 it's stressful. The outcome, not the income. Right. <laughs> I don't think anyone's in it for the income in it here. <laughs> <laughs> or, or in Chutzlar, right? Yeah, yeah, that's not it. That's not, that's not the Zach. And Ginsburg also has a whole shita from Dalai Nai. Yeah? Magnific- he wrote this like 30 years ago already. On, on Chinuch. Yeah. Beautiful. And he said there's no early with a Beautiful. That's his basis. Beautiful. Okay. I want to read again from the beginning of this piece of Rav Kook, and we'll just finish this paragraph. These godly souls, these souls before Mashiach is coming, they need more. Their visualization of what Hashem is, of what light is, is so much greater than whatever you were able to visualize for 2,000 years of exile. No one ever taught them, there's still no way of integrating. How do I take the light of the Torah and put it into the light of building the country, building the land? Kfira comes from here, where, they, they, where there's, a, there's a, it seems to be a, you know, a hit nagdut, a clash between the two. And with it also a dildul ruchani, a dwindling down of spirit, which is likened to a churban, that we see in front of us, the children of Hamish Yidin are eating pork on Yom Kippur. It's true. It's not denying it. It's just trying to explain the symptoms. Not just the symptoms, but the origin of it. But how do we heal? What does that mean? Huh? Tools. It's not talking about forks, uh, manufacturing yeah, sports. Yeah. Tools. It's a term that we use. You know, the toolbox. Yeah, very good. He's talking about a toolbox. He's talking about a because we got to pave new highways. That's a perush on Rav Kook. I don't know. Could be. Could be. I'm, I'm not sure if he's talking to the one that's presenting or to the one that's being presented. That would be ideal if you... If, if the, Right. 
המועילים לסול דרכים בשביל הסתגלות מעשית על פי האורות האותליונות. In order for them to pave the paths, in order, so that this light that now exists within the Jew that's back home in Eretz Yisrael, he can do something with it in a manner that stems with the 2,000 years of Torah that is in his DNA, whether he likes it or not. And when you don't provide the toolbox for those types of people, you have what, what we're, Baruch Hashem, have the privilege of approaching here, all over the country. When I say, I'm not talking about the rest of the world because I don't have an expectation of someone to try to make Shemayim out of Aretz when the Aretz isn't holy, out of the land. So I'm only speaking about it here. So this is, Rav, this, Mamish, just this one paragraph explains to us in a nutshell how Rav Cook, uh, what he was seeing when he looked at people, what, what, what he was thinking. Now, what was he thinking when he looked at what seemed on the surface as such a churban, and yet he's saying, are you, Mapitom, Mapitom, look deeper, it's right there. So Rav Sasson now is going to explain to us why we're learning the Torahs we're learning. Because basically the Torah that we're hopefully learning here is that toolbox. And for ourselves, אנו צריכים להתאים את ציורי המחשבה וההתבוננות אל הרוח הפנימית שבקרבנו. We need to basically take the way that our mind is thinking now. Like, I'm trying to, today, you know, today I want to, I, I should have said from the beginning, but I, I, it's very emotional for me. Today's my grandmother's yurtzeit, my grandmother that jumped off the train on the way to Auschwitz, right? Mm-hmm. This is my father's mother's yurtzeit, Chaya Bashmul. Back then, in her time, and I always think about this, as she was about to leave her mother and sister in the cattle car, and they told her, you're tiny enough to jump through the barbed wire, and you tell her, because if you do this, your great-grandchildren are going to be born in Yerushalayim. Was it, is it, was it possible to have that image unless you were like a prophet? Right? No, it was stay alive. That's all it was. I don't, I'm not trying to you know, dramatize that scene. I'm just I'm, I'm thinking about it. Like, no, it's just stay alive. Just, you could not get killed. Meanwhile, her mother and sisters went right to the gas chambers, my great-grandparents. But her? So there wasn't, there wasn't this... Like we said a few weeks ago in Shir, when a Yid sang Ani Mamin in, in Treblinka, he wasn't really thinking about Mashiach. He was thinking about just not dying. And we're a door that for us to be even like thinking about, oh my God, this actually could be the, <laughs> the big picture, right? Like we, and, and I know we actually feel that, right? It's very confusing now because it seems like we're taking one step forward and 80,000 steps back but bichlal, there was no, there wasn't even one step forward back in, in the, you know, how many years ago? 80 years ago? There wasn't, there wasn't even a kind of one step forward. So what, he, what, he, what Rav Sasson is saying is like, look, we're dealing now with, with a generation and people that are really under the rightful assumption that the, you know the concept of the whole ball of wax? You ever hear that concept before? You ever hear the, the concept of the Gantz Kesheft? No, no one's here. These I'm, I'm pulling these out of nowhere. Gansa Geshef, the whole nine yards, like <laughs> the whole nine. Right, the whole nine <laughs> yards, right? That it's actually like, like we moved here. We're building this country. We we really do think that it's gonna like it's happening and that it's gonna happen in our time. So if Sasson is saying, okay, so understand that's a, that's understand that that's a new bria. I know you maybe you're born into it. You're so used to it. That is not. Most of us are living on a soil that was not dwelled with Jewish dwelling for thousands of years. Most of us have built our homes or own or rent or home, but it doesn't matter. Our kids play on sand and on grass that was desolate of Jewish children playing on it for thousands of years. There's a higher demand of a type of Torah you learn when that's your reality. There's a higher, that's the Tviya Pnimit. There's a higher demand of a higher level of Torah when that's your mitziut, that's your reality. And Rav Sasson is saying we have to lehatim. How do you say lehatim? To adjust. To, we have to adjust the, the, that, that imagination that we now have 
to the Ruach HaPnimit that's within us, כדי לתת לה לצאת אל הפועל ולהתבטא, in order to give it a place to come out and express itself. עם תפיסת החיים של האדם בצומצמת, third line, בעוד רוחו ונשמתו שואפים לגבהים, when, if a person's, a pro, if a person's תפיסת חיים, if a person's picture of life is מצומצם, is contracted and limited, while his spirit is aspiring to great heights, הוא יחוש מחנק גדול, you'll feel choked, you'll feel suffocated. כמו אדם גדול שלבש חולצה של ילד קטן. Like an adult, like me, putting on Nachman's uh, shirt. As if they can get through my finger, right? But you'll feel suffocated. שיחוש מחנק לראותיו ונשימותיו, you'll feel choked by your lungs, your, your breathing. ובאמת דורנו נמצא במצב מיוחד. Our door is in a very special place. Why? כי הרוח הפנימית החלה להאיר. The inner spirit began to shine. אך, what's the problem? התודעה המחשבתית, but the, the, uh, what's that? the mind, עודנה אחוזה במדרגת הגלות. The way the mind comprehends things is still in גלוס. There's such a power, there's such a distance between רוח and internalization in a mind level, on a logic level. We, there's such a distance between the two. והפער בין הפנימיות הבשלה ובין התפיסה החיצוניות המצומצמת, and what does this do, this power, this distance? מוליד קושי ומסבב מחווים רבים. It brings a tremendous amount of pain and a lot, a lot of different struggles with it. צריכים אנו לתת דרור לרוחנו, we need to give freedom to our spirit, ומרחבים לנשמתנו, and widen spaces for our soul. Through what? על ידי הציורים הגדולים של העתיד, through the great illustrations and visualizations and drawings of the future, לאחל את ההסתגלות למחשבות גדולות. We have to start to understand how do you live with large, big, big, aspirations and dreams. How do you למעשה live like that? על העתיד הגדול והנפלא ההולך ומאיר אט אט towards this great future and wondrous future which is slowly shining more and more באור החדש על ציון תאיר with the new light that's shining on ציון. And now he said, and this, we're ending with this paragraph, and this is, this is the warning though, this is, a lot of people are very big in the spiritual world on the first part, I have a lot of friends over the years that on this part, they got this part down, but they don't have the next part down, and this is the danger. But God forbid, you should come to the conclusion that we're speaking about forming a new Torah. Now, you could come to that conclusion very easily. But why? Because the old Torah is what makes me feel suffocated. So he's saying, that's not what we're talking about. ולהזניח את חלקי התורה שהיו ממנו לאורך הגלות, and throw away the Mishnah Brura. Why? Oh, Radin. Where was that written? In Radin. Where's Radin? That's Gullus. Uh, the Rif, the Rambam. The Rambam! Where did the Rambam write his writings? Egypt. Rashi! Where did he write his writings? France, Spain. <coughs> Reb Sadia Gon. <coughs> the Kuzari. <coughs> Reb Nachman. Where did he write his stuff? Ukraine, right? You want, you, want to buy, you want to bring home anything from Ukraine today, right? He says, Ma pitom, Ela ha-kavana hi le-archiv et kol meren chavei ha-Torah. He's like, are you kidding me? You ha- we have all the Torah, now make it wider. Stretch it wider. Show how it's so much more relevant than the way it was taught in Galut. The Torah that was taught in Galut was still Dvar Hashem, but it was confined in its reach, because it's still Galut. Israel, Eretz Yisrael, is about wings. It's about spreading things. It's about making it so much bigger, so much wider, so much more relevant. I think we're turning abstract into concrete, right? Sorry? We're turning abstract into concrete. Mamash. There, it was just abstract, Mamash. but it's still relevant. And now we're saying, Here it's concrete. Mamash Rachetz. This is in your hands to do this. Leosif et hakomot ha'amokot v'apnimiyot. Add the inner layers of everything that was learned for 2,000 years. Hashayachot dafka le'am Yisrael bebriyuto, because 
that Torah was being learned as a preparation for an Am that's healthy in its homeland, Biyoto Be'eretz Yisrael. All those years of learning was basically just, like that's how the Ramban understands also the Indian of mitzvahs, how he's saying really only keep mitzvahs in Eretz Yisrael because Galut is just a prep, that's his shita. It's the preparation to keeping mitzvahs, meaning everything we learned until now, it's not that it's not relevant, but the way that we relate to it now means, oh my God, that was all a preparation for us to now take these godly words with the godliness that exists here in the land and spread it forth and make it so much bigger, so much wider. Take the concept of Shabbos, instead of it only meeting, meaning poppers and kiddish clubs, and how could I daven as early as possible so I could take the longest <laughs> shluf? Take Shabbos and make, it, make the concept of Shabbos wider. So too in every single mitzvah. So, Jen, let me just finish the paragraph. When this widening takes place, not only will people not feel, won't feel the need to be repulsed by Torah, Ela other Oh my God, how the potential kofar will see light with the way that you're presenting to them Torah and will rejoice over every halacha that he learns, seeing how this is such an amazing way of expressing, expressing his or her neshama. Because we're completing the picture here. Kodesh, of a holy life. Chayei nefesh ruach a life where my nefesh ruach neshama feel alive. In the light of the godly of godly life, which is hovering down upon us here in the land of life. That's what Eretz Yisrael is called, Eretz Hachaim. So that's why I remind you all the time, if 30 years ago you said you're going to a shir on a Sunday morning and you pulled out this sefer, They'd, they'd say, hey, it's not a shear, but it's cute. Right? They say, it's not, it's not a shear. What do you, this is not a shear. Why? Because what's a shear? Well, they, well, again, Torah, no, no, but that's a... <laughs> no, but, like, that's what Rav Kook said. Like, or you could say, uh, well, they wouldn't say Rav Kook, but, yeah. He was saying that they're throwing Mara down, and Mara, 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 but I'm missing... So I want to explain something. This is beautiful as explaining to us what Primius Torah is all about. The Avoda is then taking the halachas and seeing how in the Primius of them, they actually are so much bigger than it was for thousands of years. But guess what? We're in great hands. This dude is putting out a new sefer every two months. <laughs> he's the dude of all dudes, this, this Rav. He's an, he's an, he's, it's, it's unbelievable. He's taking all these, he's taking all these mitzvahs. You should see what he does with Shemitah. You should see what he does with, with basic things that you'd never think about. I saw a thing he has on women lighting Shabbos candles in the Pneumius of it. Like, there's Pneumius in every single mitzvah, but we have to remember the context of why it is. This is why we're approaching, why we're approaching Torah. And I'll tell you, it's still, it's such a work in progress, even... You know, building a, a community like this is such a work in progress because the histaglut, the, the, for it to like, you know, come together and make sense, it's a lot of tefillahs and a lot of really ratzon to open your heart more and more so that it all comes together. I do believe that the tzaddik we're going to be hearing from tonight is living this world because during the, when the epidemic began, he was one of the only ones from the world that he comes from that was being very machmir on telling people, listen, we don't know. We just don't know. Um, don't, don't ignore everything. He, he didn't even say anything to Kharif. And he was getting shechted by the whole world that basically said, you're just buying into modernity. And it's not that he was even taking a position of you know, all the stuff people got caught, caught up with. But he's, he's open to see that the world is changing. The world is constantly evolving. And there's constantly opportunities to make Shemaim on Aretz. And that's what our job is in this world. I, yeah, yeah. We'll end with your questions, then i got to run. Yeah. It's not really a question, it's kind of a statement. Statement. Um, with your statement. I asked someone who was in the And she 
does this internal work. And this heart problems and this problem and that problem. And she's like, what am I not, how am I not reaching out to the sunlight? Like, what is wrong? And she sat down and she said, I know what the kavana is that I have to have. I am creating another member in Eretz Israel, within this society. And I want I need to dob into Hashem that he could be healthy to do his part amongst this nation and bring this to and that the baby totally fine. Wow. But like wow. Like on an individual level, it could look just like that. Like wow. connecting at that level that we're not just an individual living in Eretz Israel, that we're also a part of this nation and we need to, you know Change it up. Right. Change it up. We are going, we have to get rid of our uh, call it mentality, right, instead of slave mentality. And it takes a really long time. Like, we're so close. Might, you just have to keep on working uh-huh. on that, but it. And, and who, who was part? <laughs> no. Overnight. And who was part of that Dora Midbar that didn't really see that? Not just the, not just people that came out Kofrim. The, the, the Miraglim. Exactly, the tzaddikim. the tzaddikim. That's the scariest part. The Tzadikim were the ones that created the most confusion. Because it wasn't Torah's Eretz Yisrael. It's crazy. Yeah, fear. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, listen. Next week, the, next week it won't be sheer. It won't be sheer Thursday or Sunday. Hashem will continue a week from Thursday. Okay.